And it was lovely this morning, the, the, the opening. Thank you for that. Uh, so I am sincerely grateful to Andrew, Helen, Kath, and everyone at Creative New Zealand for the invitation to join you for the big conversation. It's really a privilege and a pleasure to be back here in this soulful place. I have so many great memories from my last trip here. So the last time I was here, I gave a talk, as Helen mentioned, called Surviving the Culture Change, the thrust of which was that no organization can be granted relevance in perpetuity based on its past achievements, the permanence of its building, or the size of its budget. And that to exist, to thrive, arts organizations need to respond to the changes in their environment. Since I was here, of course, this environment, this place, was devastated by a natural disaster whose aftershocks continue to be felt both literally and metaphorically. Talk about survival, right? This is when it gets real. What do we do when our whole world literally comes tumbling down around us? I lived in New York City before I moved to the Netherlands, and New Yorkers will tell you that after the planes hit the World Trade Center, the city was a different place for a while. The shared sense of vulnerability resulted in an amazing humanity that manifested itself in many ways and that you could feel when you passed people on the street and caught their eye. I recently read the book Tribe by Sebastian Younger, who introduces the research of a man named Charles Fritz to explain why this is. Fritz asserts that disasters thrust people into a more ancient, organic way of relating to one another. As people come to face a threat, he says, class differences are temporarily erased, income disparities become irrelevant, race is overlooked, and individuals are assessed simply by what they're willing to do for the group. Sometimes a crisis can even catalyze more enduring transformation that can last years or decades even, though this is rare. Unfortunately, longer-term transformation doesn't seem to be the most likely scenario arising out of a crisis. Take, for example, the most recent global economic crisis. When the Great Recession was in full bloom in the US in early 2009, a scholar named Paul Light wrote an article in which he asked, essentially, what's going to happen in the US to the social sectors as a result of this recession, to healthcare, to education, to the arts. At the time, he hypothesized four possible scenarios for us. The first he called rescue fantasy, the scenario in which we're saved by significant increases in contributions. The second, withering winterland, the scenario in which we starve ourselves into a weakened state. Third, arbitrary winnowing, the scenario in which only the largest, oldest, wealthiest, and best connected organizations really thrive. And finally, transformation. The scenario in which we redesign ourselves to be stronger, more vibrant, more sustainable, and more impactful. Professor Light dismissed rescue fantasy, arguing that it was highly unlikely to happen. And he argued that the benefits of transformation could be reaped only by deliberate choice and action. He cautioned that if we let the future take its course, it would naturally result in withering winterland and arbitrary winnowing. We need to ask ourselves a question. Is this the future we want for the art sector? If not, then we cannot let the future take its course. We need to choose for transformation. Why? Because the fact of the matter is, the economic downturn is only one crisis facing the arts and arguably not the greatest one. At least in the US, our sector has been slowly walking towards a precipice for at least three decades. And yes, I'm referring to dwindling and aging audiences, but I'm also referring to something even more troubling. In a relatively short period of time, in the US, in the UK, and in parts of Europe, the justification for the arts has shifted from culture for the culture's sake to culture for the sake of solving social problems to culture for the economy's sake. John Holden characterizes this 
as a crisis of legitimacy, writing, somehow, over a period of decades, politics has mislaid the essence of culture and policy has lost sight of the real meaning of culture in people's lives and in the formation of their identities. We seem to be experiencing what Chip Ward calls the tyranny of the quantifiable and what Dugald Hind calls a crisis of measurement. In the US and in the UK, it's not hard to find evidence of this crisis. The arts, increasingly are expected to pay their way or contribute to economic growth. Risk is approached as a problem to be managed rather than as inherent to the process of creativity. Arts organizations must continually justify their worth and account for funds in advance of spending them. There's interest in our numbers, but not really in our content. Donors want to put their names on our buildings, but have little attention for sustaining the art and culture inside of them. The largest organizations are invariably seen as the most valuable in the arts ecosystem. And arts groups are expected to use business jargon and to see their communities as potential markets, their fellow citizens as potential customers, and the culture as an exploitable product. I'm curious which of these symptoms you may also recognize in New Zealand. As institutions that exist ostensibly to foster such things as beauty, meaning making, understanding, empathy, and social cohesion, I think we need to care very much about this economic rationalization of what we do. Of course, the arts are not alone in this crisis. We have witnessed this retooling in almost every area of social life. That, in any event, is the thesis of Harvard political philosopher Michael Sandel, who argues in his book, What Money Can't Buy, that we have shifted from having a market economy to becoming a market society, in which market relations and market incentives and market values come to dominate all aspects of life. As Sandel asks, is this the way we want to live? Put another way, are we going to let ourselves get dragged along with this retooling and embrace the market? Or are we going to resist and embrace a different value system? That word embrace is, of course, consciously chosen, as this conference is a quest for, a call for embracing arts and embracing audiences. And I love this word because it's so visceral. When I hear the word embrace, I think of arms wide open, letting down one's guard, heart meeting heart. I think of this scene at the end of Love Actually with the shots of people meeting their loved ones at Heathrow Airport. I think of the difference between an embrace that is polite but half-hearted and an embrace that is fueled by love and how terrible the first kind can feel. This talk is primarily aimed at inspiring you to let down your guards in order to achieve what Doug Borwick calls transformational engagement, meaning engagement with the community that changes the way your organization thinks and what it does. This is not a talk about marketing strategies and practices. It's a talk about relevance, about matteringness. So without further ado, I humbly share five ways to foster transformative engagement. Number one, let the community back in. For the past half century, there's been a working assumption that professionalization in the arts has been an unqualified good thing. But I think we need to seriously question this idea and acknowledge what has been lost in the name of professionalization. By the way, I see you making notes. You'll get a copy of this talk uh, afterwards, so you don't have to take notes if you don't want to. All right. Uh, uh, when, we, when we professionalized, not only did we revoke in some cases, the opportunity for citizens to express themselves as creators and makers, but more generally, we abandoned the possibility of becoming fully and completely communal organizations. So one pathway to transformative engagement is to design programs to let the community back in. In the US, the hands down poster child for leading this sort of organizational transformation is the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History run by the visionary Nina Simon. And here she is giving a TED talk. Simon is a former engineer, 
who has deployed her human-centered design skills to turn a traditional object-oriented museum into what she calls a participatory museum. And if you've never read her blog, Museum 2.0, you must. And she has a new book coming out in a couple of weeks called The Art of Relevance, and I highly recommend it. Briefly, here are a few other examples. The Baltimore Symphony Orchestra has created a program called the Mus Rusty Musicians Concert, which invites hundreds of amateur instrumentalists to play alongside its professional musicians a few times a year. One amateur characterized his experience as life-changing. Likewise, here's a photo of 200 citizens performing alongside professionals in The Tempest as part of a new program at the Public Theater in New York City called Public Works. The Public, by the way, produced the show Hamilton, which has just won a slew of awards at the Tony Awards, so highly professional organization. And in 2007, the Houston Grand Opera made an extraordinary commitment to commission and produce one new <coughs> opera every year based on stories of the people and by the people of its region. The most recent project, called After the Storm, tells the story of two massive hurricanes that hit the region about 100 years apart, one of which killed more than 6,000 people. <coughs> Alongside producing the opera, HGO also hosted an open mic night at a local speakeasy. Local poets, storytellers, and musicians performed their hurricane tales, as did members of the general public. These are three examples of world-class institutions designing programs to invite the community back in after decades of keeping them out in the name of professionalization. Nina Simon says, there's a question she asks herself anytime she's working on something with a participatory intent. How can I invite people, staff, volunteers, community members, to help make this project better. By all accounts, Simon's efforts have paid off. Since she became executive director of the museum in 2011, attendance has tripled, membership has increased by 50%, and more than 4,000 local artists and community groups have collaborated on exhibitions and cultural events. The museum has gone from five years in the red to three years of significant budget growth and surpluses. Simon has led an institutional turnaround based on creative risk-taking, grassroots participation, and unexpected community partnerships. This is social enterprise at its best. Imagine what could happen if you asked this question of every project, every initiative, every aspect of your organization. Number two, practice radical hospitality. Quote, Time and again, research reveals that the biggest barriers for a disinclined audience are indifference and low familiarity, often coupled with a perception of the organization as elitist." End quote. This according to a report by the Wallace Foundation in the US, which has for years funded research on audience engagement. It's not hard to understand why some people feel this way if we reflect on the fact that in the US and Europe, for decades, we have perpetuated the notion that the fine or high arts are a certain kind of fair for a certain kind of people. If we want to reach non-traditional audiences, then I believe we need to consciously practice radical hospitality in four areas. Where the art happens, what's programmed, how much we charge, and how we approach people to tell them about the work. I first encountered the term radical hospitality on the website of a theater company called Mixed Blood, which uses the term to describe the philosophy underpinning its new pricing policy, which is this. Anyone can get a free admission to any Mixed Blood show any day of the week. As with other organizations that have dramatically lowered their prices, if not to free, then to a price that is more affordable, Mixed Blood has experienced an increase in attendance, an increase in donations, and a dramatic shift in its audience demographics, attracting those who are both younger and more diverse. National Theatre of Scotland is just one of several great examples of practicing radical hospitality with place. It formed as a theater without walls because it didn't want to limit its reach to those who lived in Glasgow or had the time and resources to travel there. 
Arts organizations are increasingly leaving their venues to produce events throughout their communities, designing their spaces to be more social, interactive, or family friendly, inviting the public to attend rehearsals, and putting both performances and behind the scenes content online. One of my favorite examples of radical hospitality and programming comes from Center Stage Theater in Baltimore. When artistic director Irene Lewis joined Center Stage in the 1990s, the theater was primarily producing white plays by white playwrights for white audiences. The city of Baltimore, however, is 67% African American. Lewis felt that the theater was basically ignoring two thirds of the community, and so she began producing two or three plays each year out of six that were by African-American playwrights or that featured African-American stories or characters. When the, ch when the change was made, the theater initially lost many of its white subscribers. However, Center Stage persevered and eventually replaced those lost subscribers with new patrons who embraced the new philosophy and values of the theater. Notably, a key to Center Stage's success was that it didn't simply change the programming. It also changed its promotional materials to include images of African Americans attending the theater, which brings me to promotions and communications. Radical hospitality means we also need to think carefully about the values we stand for and how these are being consistently communicated. What do I mean by that? Here's a brochure by an opera company in the US. What do I notice immediately? Well, for one, Everyone in this picture is wearing fancy clothing. What else? I see the word insiders. It's all well and good that the tickets are not very expensive, but we need to ask ourselves, what does this photo tell us about who is or isn't part of the opera? And what values are we triggering in the people receiving this brochure? Inclusivity or its opposite? Are the images and texts that we use to appeal to people further perpetuating cultural divides by signaling to some members of the community that they would not belong? UK author and arts leader Julia Roundtree once commented to me that arts organizations are one of the few places that have the capacity to bring people together across divides on equal terms. Her comment stopped me in my tracks. And this was my very next thought. So isn't it radically important that we do this? I think it is. Number three, be the kitchen table, be the campfire. Russell Willis Taylor, who for years ran the leadership organization National Arts Strategies, gave a talk last year, and a comment she made has stayed with me. She said, a community isn't just an audience. A community talks back, and it criticizes, and it challenges, and it questions, and it reshapes our organizations to fit its needs, or it walks away if we will not listen. Russell is, of course, absolutely right. A community isn't just an audience. And if we don't want the community to walk away, then I believe we need to be the campfire, be the kitchen table that can hold the space for an ongoing conversation by and with the community. And I want to give a few examples of arts organizations who are doing just that. Led by Melanie Joseph for two decades, the Foundry Theater in New York has produced some of the most exquisite theatrical experiences I have ever taken part in. Parallel to producing great theater, the Foundry also hosts an ongoing dialogue series that brings together artists and other citizens to discuss important issues like water, gentrification, and hunger. Melanie Joseph is not torn between either making beautiful art or being an activist working to disrupt the status quo. She does both. She is an activist astete. Second, a few moments ago I mentioned Center Stage Theater in Baltimore and their change in programming. This top photo is of Center Stage's current artistic director, Kwame Kweyer Ma, who replaced Irene Lewis when she left. When Kwame came to the US in 2011 from Britain, he asked 50 writers to write him a monologue about America entitled, My America. When he recently repeated the exercise, issues around Black Lives Matter emerged as a theme. So Kwame commissioned six new plays, 
each written in direct response to recent police killings in cities across America. Each play was filmed in the location of one of the six shootings. And each play took place around a metaphorical kitchen table. Kwame is quoted in the newspaper saying of the uniting element, the American kitchen table is a place where honest discussion can happen. And that is also the aim of the event pictured below him. It is a gathering of Baltimore citizens to discuss the six plays, all of which were streamed on YouTube, and to engage in a discussion about the topic, Black Lives Matter. I love these initiatives because they're built around an understanding that the arts have a fundamental role to play in drawing people together, not only to spectate, but to reflect, discuss, debate, and imagine. Now, of course, not every conversation needs to be political and focused on the big issues of our time. Sometimes the conversation we need to foster is more intimate, more lighthearted, more like sitting around a campfire. When the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Philadelphia decided it wanted to do a better job of reaching young professionals, 18 to 34, who had never visited the museum, it created an evening event built around the idea of a salon. They had brief gallery talks, social games that encouraged visitors to explore the museum's collection and share their observations with each other, a bar, and live music. The after hours events now regularly attract capacity crowds of 800 young people a month, 90% of whom visit the galleries and say it's their favorite part of the evening. What I particularly like about this program is the focus on keeping the art at the center of the social experience, making it a catalyst for a connection between people. Deborah Cullen, the executive director of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, recently wrote a blog post titled, What if art centers existed to ignite radical citizenship? I love this question and the vision that it promotes. We need to create the space for conversation about the ideas that matter to those in our community. Why? In times of uncertainty, marked by environmental, economic, and geopolitical vulnerability, the conversation enables artists and other community members to come together to share their stories, fears, hopes, values, and knowledge, and to imagine and create a more beautiful future together. The conversation is what shifts us from having a transaction to having an interaction. The conversation is what connects us between ticketed events. The conversation is what connects us even when the art event itself and other things in the world divide us. The conversation is what creates community. Number four, focus on impact rather than size, form covenants rather than contracts. So you may be asking yourself, who are these two serious looking guys with their V-neck sweaters and their geeky eyewear? Their names are Yulan Wang and Seth Rosner. And about five years ago, I read a New York Times article about them examining the remarkable success of their avant-garde jazz label called Pi. The story caught my attention because at the time, many music labels were struggling, but Pi was having tremendous success. How did they do it? Here were four lessons I gleaned from that article. First, Pi only works with artists it loves and it gives every artist ample resources, attention, time, and support to make excellent work. Two, Pi releases only a handful of albums per year and virtually everything it releases meets with critical acclaim. It has a great reputation, a very clear niche, and because of this, a devoted and growing fan base. Three, Given the small number of albums it releases and the limited market for avant-garde jazz, Pi keeps its overheads very low. By staying small, they have been able to maintain artistic integrity. And fourth, Pi measures its success based not on the size of its market, but on whether it is keeping its jazz fans happy and gradually developing new jazz listeners. These four mutually reinforcing aspects of pies of pie combine to create a sustainable business model. 
Put another way, Pi's success reminds us why small can be beautiful, why small can be better. Rather counterintuitively in the nonprofit arts and culture sector, we seem to have a bias against small. But in a world where agility is needed to respond to a rapidly changing environment, and where technology has made it possible for people to organize without having to form large, formal, geographically based organizations, maybe it's time to recognize the strengths of having a sector made up of hundreds of small enterprises, each with a clear focus and a base of fans. Here's another example of a small niche or arts organization, this one focused on the classical canon that has survived a long time by cultivating a loyal patron base. The Bach Choir of Bethlehem is a nonprofit festival that has been operating continuously since 1912 and that has a unique patronage model. Since its inception, the choir has employed a system of guarantees, which give patrons the opportunity to book tickets first and to choose seats according to the number of years in a row that they have supported the choir with an annual minimum pledge. While the pledge is made in advance of the festival, it's not payable until after the festival. And here's the really interesting aspect of this model from my point of view. At the end of the season, guarantors are rarely asked to pay the full amount that they have pledged. Instead, most years, they're asked to pay only a portion of their pledge, an amount that's based on what the choir actually needs to balance its budget. In other words, the Bach Choir of Bethlehem contains its, its expenses and then offers to redistribute its surpluses to its fans. It uses only what it needs for now, trusting that its fans will be back the following year to again provide support. By doing this, the choir is continually earning, strengthening, and reciprocating the trust of its patrons. A key lesson of both Pi and the Bach Theater of Bethlehem is this. Bach Choir of Bethlehem is this. Fans don't want to be customers. As the Liverpool football team evidently recently learned. Many thanks to Andrew for sharing these photos with me. The first shows the ambition of the managers and owners of the team. If you can't read this, it says, transforming fans into customers. And the second is the response from the fans, sorry, <laughs> supporters, not customers. <laughs> I would characterize the relationship that Bach Choir of Bethlehem has to its guarantors and Pi has to its fans as a covenant rather than a contract. New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote a couple of months back, a contract protects people's interests, but a covenant protects relationships. A covenant exists between people who understand they're part of one another. People in a contract provide one another services, but people in a covenant delight in offering each other gifts. If we want to matter more to people, perhaps we need to make covenants with them. As Andrew recently wrote, it's hard to love, support, belong to, donate to, volunteer, or advocate for an organization that only wants you as a customer. When our audience has more ambition for us than we have for ourselves, we are truly through the commercial looking glass. We begin to treat our fans like customers, I believe, when we become more interested in the money they represent than in the gift of their presence and their contributions of attention, ideas, creativity, opinions, knowledge, and love. Be cautious of growing so large that you are forced to demand more from your true fans or the community at large than they feel willing to give you. To be sustained, relationships need to be good for both parties. Which brings me to the last recommendation. Create scaffolds of meaning making rather than money making. So this is a graphic published by a Boston consulting firm called Target Resource Group. Here's how it describes the goal of increasing patron loyalty on its blog. We love loyal patrons. Why? Simply put, they make money for arts organizations and they make arts managers' jobs easier. This graphic is what I mean by a scaffold of money-making. 
As the last section tried to convey, we've got things entirely upside down if we love our patrons first and foremost because we love their money. How does it feel if you think about being the patron in this scenario? Do you feel loved? Or do you feel a bit objectified, exploited, dehumanized even? Not only is there something much more valuable that we need from our patrons than their money, this sort of philosophy upheld over time will invariably orient an organization toward caring more about those who can buy more tickets and donate more money. So what might we do instead? Here's an example from the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in California, which instituted a new program several years ago now called YBCA U. This program began with three goals, to increase frequency, expand the diversity of experiences for participants, and build a community around art. And it has been successful on all three counts. And here's how it works. Like a gym membership, for $15 a month, you get access to a slew of cultural and social events at YBCA and at other partner organizations around the city. But here's the part I love best. When you sign up with the program, you take a survey, and then you receive a phone call inviting you to come in and meet with your own personal art coach. This staffer essentially does an intake with you. He or she talks with you about your goals, your history with art, which might be nothing or might be quite a bit, gets to know you, and then helps you begin to come up with a customized cultural immersion plan for enhancing your creative life. And here's an interesting tidbit. The staff member who designed this program came from a background in public health. He basically adapted the case management model to arts engagement. What is so brilliant about this program from my perspective is that it recognizes two fundamental truths. Cultivating a relationship to art is a lifetime journey and one organization is just one aspect of that journey. And one's tastes and the value one places on the arts increase the more experiences one has. This is a scaffold of meaning making. By the way, very little of Yerba Buena's income comes from ticket sales. A majority of their income comes from four sources, rental of their facility by community groups, raffle tickets from their own raffle, city government, and other sources of contributed income, private money. Investing in meaning making <coughs> does result in money making, but in a way that reinforces the sense of Yerba Buena as a public good. Like other examples I've given today, their model has structural integrity because there is an economic, aesthetic, and ethical logic that underpins it. Here's another example of creating a scaffold of meaning making, but in another sector. As some of you may know, the slow food movement was launched in 1986 as a response to the emergence of McDonald's in Rome and the spread of the values and practices of the fast food industry and big agribusiness. The movement was, at its heart, about changing people's relationship to food through a range of strategies, including taste education which is aimed at reawakening and training the senses and encouraging the study of food and its production. Importantly, when you shop at the local farmer's market, you're not just exchanging $10 for a hunk of cheese. You're exchanging values and knowledge. If you're a member of Slow Food, you shift from being a food consumer to being a co-producer, someone making choices on a daily basis that support the movement's goals. Consider for a moment the enormous impact the slow food movement has had over the past three decades. How much more we think about what and how we eat and where our food came from than we did in the 1960s and 70s when I was growing up. Compare that to what has happened with the arts over the same period of time. Importantly, slow food is a move back to principles and practices that were in place before the Industrial Revolution. It represents an understanding that what we once called progress was not progress once we factored in the environmental, human, and cultural costs. It's the same with the arts. Much of what we called progress in the arts the past 50 years was a move that took the arts out of the day-to-day -day lives of people 
and made them something precious for the cultured few. In the arts, we are, in the US in particular, we are overdue for a movement that will fundamentally change the way our communities at large relate to the arts. We need to embrace some principles and practices that were in place before the professionalization of the arts and with them, their corporatization. One brief related personal anecdote. So last year, I taught a course in beauty and aesthetics to business school students. Now, if you're wondering why a business school would say yes to someone proposing to teach a course in beauty, then you need to understand that over the past couple of decades, while the arts sector has been learning to become more business-like, business types have been trying to become more like us, more cultural, more communal, more authentic. When I designed the beauty class, I actually started with two models in mind, the YBCAU program and the slow food movement. One of the experiences I assigned to the beauty class students was to visit an ex exhibition of contemporary Chinese art at the Chazen Art Museum. This is one of the pieces that they encountered. Before looking at the title of the piece, one of the students observed, where is this guy going? He looks like he's striding into hell. And I laughed. The piece is called Busy People Number One. <laughs> and I remember thinking, yes, and that is exactly where constant busyness and a relentless focus on business seem to lead us. Virginia Woolf writes in her book, Three Guineas, if people are highly successful in their professions, they lose their senses. Sight goes. They have no time to look at pictures. <coughs> Sound goes. They have no time to listen to music. Speech goes. They have no time for conversation. They lose their sense of proportion, the relations between one thing and another. Humanity goes. We've made tremendous administrative progress the past 50 years. We have learned how to hustle ticket sales and contributions and balance our budgets. But how well is this serving our longer term goals? What is this hustling doing to our organization's soul? Christy Edmonds, the former curator of the Melbourne Festival, recently commented in an interview when in history did we begin to celebrate and honor administrivia and spreadsheets above literature, painting, dance, music, theater, sculpture, the contributions of artists to human awareness? Quite possibly when we started to place our collective institutional report cards up on the national fridge and ask for applause. So. Those are five ideas for how we might more meaningfully engage with our communities, but there's more. I have a few more slides, just some concluding thoughts. I mentioned earlier that there seem to be two paths before arts organizations, one calling us to embrace the market and the other calling us to embrace a different value system. In a similar vein, Seth Godin writes, there's one view of the world called the Walmart view that says that what all people want is as much stuff as possible for as cheap a price as possible. And that's a world based on scarcity. I don't have enough stuff. How do I get more stuff? There's a different view, which is the view based on abundance. And in an abundance economy, the things we don't have enough of are connection and time. Which worldview has your organization embraced? Which will you embrace in the future? The one defined by scarcity, where our audiences are relegated to spectating, where our marketing mix reinforces societal divides, where people show up once every two years to consume some art, where what matters is how many people like your Facebook page or buy tickets to your shows, where art is a private good exchanged for cash, where you love your patrons in relationship to how much money you can get from them, and where the arts are valued because they are perceived to be an engine for the economy? 
Or are you going to embrace the one defined by abundance, where the community is invited to co-create, where the arts fulfill their unique role of bringing people together across divides on equal terms, where the community gathers around the campfire to understand itself, where what matters is how much impact you have and where art is a gift exchanged between people in a relationship, where we are interested in being part of someone's lifetime journey with art and in making that journey a more meaningful one, and where the arts are seen as a common good valued by society because they are the way we share with one another what it means to be human. Two worldviews, embrace the market or embrace the community. From where I sit, New Zealand, you are primed to choose the community. Because at the heart of it, these are values and practices that are inherent to your society, and in particular, to an indigenous worldview, and are here upheld by the Maori culture. Sebastian Younger asserts that modern society has perfected the art of making people feel unnecessary, and that tribal cultures can teach us a lot about loyalty, belonging, and the eternal quest for meaning, which at the heart of it is what I've been talking about today. Nevertheless, you must choose the community path or else you will default to, the mark, to the embracing the market. Why? Because it's not just in the United States that we are becoming a market society. Indeed, one can see evidence of it in the UK, across Europe, and yes, in Australia and in New Zealand. You too face growing income inequality and pressure for the arts to contribute to economic growth and declines in funding due to the loss of lottery funds and the threat of an increasingly winner-take-all art sector. You can let yourself get dragged along with the larger forces or you can resist. And the fact of the matter is our communities need us to resist the market, now perhaps as much as ever. New York Times columnist David Brooks argues that there are forces coursing through modern societies, all of them, that while liberating the individual are challenging to social cohesion, meaning the willingness of members of a society to cooperate with each other in order to survive and prosper together. Friends, this is our crisis today, and we need to wake up to it. Who better than the arts to contribute to the fostering of community of social cohesion? And do we understand that without this trust and cohesion that many other things, including the economy, will begin to break down? I took this photo. It's in color, believe it or not. Well, it does look pretty good here. When I was at a Common Cause retreat um, several years ago, Common Cause is an organization that encourages nonprofits to work together to advance a common set of compassionate values. At this residential training, we lived in eco huts uh, in the rain and in a remote part of Wales. And at the first gathering, we sat in a circle and we talked about why we had chosen to be there. And here's what I said. I'm here because I'm trying to figure out what I'm laboring for that transcends arts and culture. I'm here because I feel like I've been talking in a closed circuit, and I want to join up the conversation we're having in the arts with the conversation others are having about the environment or human rights or education. I'm here because I don't know if I can continue to work on behalf of the arts if the arts are only interested in advancing themselves. I'm here because I'm worried about things like growing income inequality and I suspect that growing income inequality may actually benefit the arts. And what are we going to do about that? I'm here because I'm worried about cultural divides and that the arts perpetuate them more than they help to bridge them. That realization at that event has inspired much of my writing and thinking the past few years, including ideas in this talk. I believe the arts could be a force for good, but I believe we will need to change as leaders and as organizations in relationship to our communities for them to be so, particularly in the US. Let us be your cautionary tale. 
Here's a question you might consider sometime. What are you laboring for that transcends your organization and your position within it? What values, goals, or progress in the world? Indeed, what are we all laboring for? What's the change we want to see? How about less injury and more beauty in the world? When I asked the beauty class students to write to me and tell me how, if at all, the course was changing them, one student wrote, this course is transforming us into people who care. That's what the arts have the ability to do. The writer Jeanette Winterson says that art is a different value system. And the writer Bill Sharp says that art is the way we share with one another what it means to be human. Do we believe them? Are we game for that work? If so, then that is where we need to put our attention. Finding the resources to do what we do is necessary, but it's not the point of our existence. Our concern is relevance. Our concern is mattering. Hustling ticket sales and contributions will not get us there. I know you are all doing extraordinary work, yet I challenge you to ask yourself, where can we be better? I encourage you to let down your guards wherever you can and to let the community in so you can co-create together. Thank you for your kind attention.